good afternoon. It's good to be with you today for our Bible study time. And uh, I'd like to, in the next couple of studies, to look at a uh, study we began last week in the sermon on Psalm 27, uh, uh, excuse me, Psalm uh, 27.4. Uh, we looked at the fact that David's one desire was to dwell in the presence of the Lord, to dwell in God's house. The reason I chose that is because although we all yearned for things to be like they were, uh, for people to be serving like they did, really the baseline of where we are spiritually as a church it really can be boiled down to this one thing. Am I dwelling in God's presence? Am I meeting with Him daily? And we could be meeting together for church every week, but if we're not meeting with the Lord individually and collectively, then we're missing the entire purpose for which Christ died. He didn't die for us so much as he died for his own glory. And what God's great desire is, is, is that his people would gather and worship him, that all his people would gather together to worship him. From God's perspective, that really is what it's all about. In that, he redeems men. In that, men worship him. And that's only not only true in the Old Testament, it's true in the New Testament time, the church age. And it's also true, we'll see it even in the eternal purposes of God. If you get to the end of Revelation, God says, I will be their God and they'll be my people. We'll dwell together. And that's what God wants. So the studies that we're going to look at here together are simply called the meeting place, the meeting place. I thought that would be a bad name for our church or any church, would it? The meeting place. It might not get the vibe in society that they understand church as being, but for you and I as God's people, that would be a fitting name because this is where people come and meet with God. That is what the church is all about. We want to take a historical look at that in the Word of God and and uh, take that approach as we begin our study together. It's been very fruitful to my own soul and again underscores or underlines the importance of the church. Not only the church being the church, but the church in community. Acts 2, uh, kind of church, 42. That's what God is looking for. He wanted it then, when the church began. He wants it today. And the question posed to God's people today is, are we all about meeting with God individually and collectively? Because those two truths are like railroad tracks that are taught throughout the Scripture. they are taught throughout the Scripture. God is looking for a people to worship Him, a people to gather in His name. And that's where you and I come in today. Let's begin with a word of prayer and then we'll open the text together. Father, we thank you that uh, we are your people, that, Lord, in your saving us, you sanctified us, and, Lord, your purpose to bring us together. You're the head, we're the body. You're the head of the church, and, Lord, may the church gather unto you in submission, in service, loving service to you. Lord, help us to just recognize some of these things, maybe appreciate them more dearly, and, Lord, that we might realize that as we worship you, Lord, we do the very thing that you want to accomplish in us. Uh, Lord, you deserve uh, the praises of your people. You dwell in the habitation of your house. And Lord, may we understand that. And may even our coming to church not be a mere formal exercise. But Lord, may it be that which exalts you. And Lord, that ignites our hearts toward you. In your name I will pray these things. Amen. Amen. Well, sometimes, uh, I think today, the attitude toward church, generally so, and has been for some time, we, uh, even Christians have a rather casual attitude toward church, wasn't so in the past. Church was thought to be necessary, not only for the saved, but even by the unsaved. It was a vital part of community life. That's why you drive around these portions of New England, and you see town upon town, you see steeples uh, raised up in the sky, as an indication of the fact that God's the center of this community. We worship God here. And friends, we still have one of those old steeples in our community. And it ought to be 
a matter of uh, godly goodness. It ought to be a matter of pride for the Christian to, to know that we, we are associated with that place. Uh, on the other hand, for a Christian to be calling themselves professing to be Christians, or professing Christ, and not to belong or be involved in a local church, uh, it's so anti-biblical. It's unlike what God has ever designed. Uh, God never designed a Christian to grow and go and function on their own. Every Christian ought to be plugged into, actively involved in the church's worship and service. And uh, that's what we need to understand, I think, as God's people uh, today, at least for you and I. <clears throat> Those involved in God's work in the church, at least we ought to be convinced and confident in the fact that we... <clears throat> that we're doing the work of God as best we can today, that we're being obedient in our fellowship. Interestingly enough, <clears throat> if, I make, if, I make it, <clears throat> if I make it through this study, uh, we realize that uh, there are many so-called house of gods in our world, uh, and just because they have the title church or house of God, whatever it might be, it doesn't necessarily mean that that is true concerning them. <clears throat> By true, I mean meeting the Bible criteria for the house of God. Not all churches today, we have some in the, in the communities uh, that are uh, so-called churches, but they're just old buildings, empty buildings. And they no longer meet the criteria of being a place where God's people come to fellowship with him. And uh, God determines these things, not man. So there are hundreds, thousands of buildings across our land that carry the name church on the outside, but they're not churches in the biblical sense. Why? Because they're not a place where weekly God meets with his people. That's what he's deemed it to be today. It would, we, we would weekly uh, fellowship with him. So we need to be uh, understanding of these things as we talk about the concept or the principle of church. Any discussion of the house of God is at its core a place where God, where God has initiated a place to worship him. Even as a church building as ours would be built. Uh, that doesn't make it a church. What makes it a church is where God meets with his people. And that's what I, I find a, a great blessing today. A people of God with God over them. God being exalted in their midst. Where did this all begin? Well, really we see the beginning of it, the need for a place of worship, a meeting place, back in Genesis 3. We know the story well back in Genesis 3, Adam and Eve sin, and that sin caused a great separation, a break in fellowship between God and man. I don't know what form it took, but it seems each day God came down and walked in the garden. He met with Adam and Eve. That was their place, their point of fellowship, when God came down and met them in the garden. But that meeting was that meeting place or that fellowship that he had with man but was broken by sin. And by the way of making a sacrifice, God was able to once again restore that fellowship. But the, the fellowship that sin broke could only be fixed. The problem could only be mended so long as there was a sacrifice. That's what we learn in Genesis 3 when the Lord came down and shed the blood of animals, and put coats of skins upon Adam and Eve. That, in a very clear sense, was an establishment uh, of their fellowship once again. It was impossible, apart from the shedding of blood, even back at that time. Any true place of worship is based upon, grounded two things. This sacrifice, sacrifice made for the sins of man, and that being the basis whereby man could now come and have fellowship with God. It wouldn't do much good if God came and dwelt in this building every Sunday, but the doors were locked. It wouldn't do much good for us, because both God's presence 
and the redemption of man is are essential to our being able to worship the Lord as we should. You know, we think about that. Uh, we come together on the basis of Christ's death, of his forgiveness of sin. Apart from that, we can never be in communion with God. We never could be one with him. We could never have that fellowship. And that's the basis. That's the reason for the basis I said earlier. There are many places that call themselves churches, a house of worship. They have signs out in front of their building. They meet each week. But many times it's just a group of people meeting. It doesn't demand or mean that God comes in their midst any more than in our so-called Christian churches. We can have church every week. But it doesn't mean that we're worshiping Him. We can have music, great music going on and great things happening. But God can be left out of all of it. We find that in the book of Revelation. The church can be so busy that it's too busy for God. And it wouldn't make any difference if God showed up or not. They're going to go through the same antics every week. And things look good from man's perspective. But has God chosen to come down? He who walks in the midst of the candlesticks. He is the Lord over them. He is the judge over them. And he's the one who can discern whether or not we have come together, as those seven churches in Revelation, whether or not we come together to worship him or for other purposes. It's very possible, and it's happening across our land, where people are gathering even on Sunday, week after week, and they're not coming to worship God. They're coming for some other reason. And if that's the case, God can withdraw his glory as he did in the Old Testament. And they will go through the antics of worship, but God will not be in it. And uh, that's the warning to, uh, I think, the church today. And we'll look at that as we get to a study in Revelation pretty soon. So we need to understand that when we call a place a church or the house of God, it, it must recognize and, and reckon those two things, that God's a holy God, that man's a sinful creature, and the only way we can come to God and worship with him or worship him, exalt him, praise him, is upon the basis of the blood of Jesus Christ. There must be a sacrifice that enables God's people to fellowship with him again. Apart from that sacrifice, it would be impossible for man man and God to fellowship together because that fellowship has been broken by sin. And, uh, and so there we have uh, that. We found that in Genesis 11. I looked over at Genesis 11. And it was man's attempt at building a church, a place whereby man might reach God. But that's never the way it is. That's not the biblical concept of a meeting place with God. That was, we know that, particularly with Satan's attempt at religion and much of what we have going on today the same way that calls itself religion is nothing more than man's attempt at building its own way to God. What does it not deal with? The problem of sin. It isn't founded upon the, the redemption that's in Christ's blood. No, they're, they're, they're no more than religious effort of men to reach God. And sometimes, like the day of the Pharisees, uh, in New Testament days, it was no more than man's religion, man's attempt at religion. God was not in it, and neither is God in it today in such churches as these. So we need to remember this, that church, or the meeting place between God and men, is always initiated by God himself, by the Lord himself. Think about that for a moment. We could not have church here next Sunday unless God initiated that we worship him together here in this place. It's got to be God's design by his initiative and apart from God's initiative in it, it's no more than a work of the flesh. I was struck by that again and again as I, as I read John six forty four. Jesus said, "No man cometh the, no man comes to me unless the Father what draws him." There could be no dwelling place where men could come and meet with God unless God 
designed it that way. He deemed it to be the case. Even at the erection of a building here, uh, he, as we found in the Old Testament, there was a dedication, a time in, in uh, 1902, when this building was dedicated to the Lord, where the people petitioned God to come and meet with Him. That doesn't mean He will. He will if we meet the criteria. And that's what we need to be, uh, I need to be reminded of again. At the heart of a meeting place, I use that term and it covers a, a, a genre, a temple, tabernacle, house of God, church. All of those things come under the umbrella of the abiding presence of God. Think about it. That's no, that's no trivial pursuit. To have a place where we can come and meet with God, we ought to be as awestruck as the people of Israel were back in the days in the wilderness. They saw the presence of God, and boy, they, they, they had a hard time imagining that, that they could approach Him. They told Moses coming off the mountain, Mo Moses, you tell us, you tell us what God said. We don't want to see Him for ourselves. And yet today we take it so lightly, sometimes so flippantly, this thing of worship, uh, friends, there ought to be a reverential awe in us. Many of the scriptures attest to that. And yet today, it's almost a lost thing. We're so casual about church, church life, Christian living, the Word of God, that even God himself doesn't wow us too much. I'm thankful here for the music ministry and the ministry of the Word of God because it speaks to us. It draws us to the Lord in the sense of our focus and our attention that other things might be put off, that we might fix our attention on the one we come to worship indeed. We get to the Old Testament, this presence of God was initially uh, recognized by God's people uh, by the Shekinah or in the Shekinah glory. I know individually, for example, Moses of the burning bush, God coming and speaking with Noah. I know initially God manifested himself and his presence came to individuals. But that was never the establishment of a meeting place. Uh, not, not in the sense that we understand it today. The Shekinah glory of God, uh, that word Shekinah is used in some root forms, but it's not particularly mentioned. It's understood as the visible, abiding presence of God. It might be temporary, but it's the visual manifestation of God's glory on earth. We know that God dwells in the heavens. But from time to time through the history of the scriptures we see, God has determined not only that he would dwell in the heavens, but he's determined that he would dwell on earth among his people corporately. That's always God's way with his people. It was with his people Israel, and then when he established the church, it became the same means of worship for the, his people, uh, the church, that they, were, uh, that they would come and, and dwell with him. While God is omnipresent, he is determined that we, that we as a people on earth dwell in his manifold presence, that we would meet him in that way. <clears throat> the word Shekinah means that very thing. It means to, to dwell, to dwell. And the word tabernacle comes out of that same word. It's, it's the dwelling place. It's the dw dwelling place. We could have a sign out front, uh, as I said, where we're, where we, the people, meet with God. And that might put a little different slant on our thought of walking in the doors of church uh, because it is a special place. It's sanctified not by our presence so much as it is sanctified by God's presence. Yes, it's sanctified by our presence because the Holy Spirit of God now dwells in every believer. So like the tabernacle of old, it was sanctified, and all the instruments thereof were sanctified by blood. And this place is indeed, it becomes a sacred place. 
That's why it's so sad or difficult when we see a church like we had down at Hollis long before I came here, the old Hollis Center Church, when it was sold off to a, a worldly secular group uh, and, and it became a, a haven for gambling or drinking, whatever might go on there. No longer a place sanctioned by God. When we look at the church today, any church that claims to be Christian ought to be a place that is recognized as being sanctified unto the Lord God. That was the case in that was the case in the Old Testament, uh, because the Shekinah glory, the idea of God's presence, uh, really became manifested. The first time we find this thought of dwelling in the Scripture is is after the uh, uh, Noah and his family came off the ark. And God made a covenant with Noah again, and he made his promises. And in Genesis 9, 27, he said, uh, in that verse, he said that God may dwell in the tents of Shem. One other earlier uh, Aramaic translation uh, translated that verse this way. He will cause his Shekinah to dwell in the dwelling place of Shem. One thing for sure, when Noah and his family came off the ark, in that, even in those words, God initiated, established a dwelling place for the people to gather, for the people to worship Him. And uh, certainly we know as God's people, that's true of us. Let's go together this, this uh, study uh, to Exodus chapter 13. Exodus 13. Verse 21, Exodus 13, verse 21. Here in this account, we have the people of Israel, the Hebrew Christians, <laughs> Hebrews that is, being led out of Egypt by Moses. And in that, we find these words in verse 21, The Lord went before them by day in a pillar of a cloud and led them in the way. That's the first thing we notice. And it says also, And by night, a pillar of fire to give them light, to enlighten them, to go by day and night. The cloud by day, the pillar of fire by night, that he might lead the people. Verse 22 says, He took not away the pillar of cloud by day, nor the pillar of fire by night from before the people. Sometimes we overlook that. It wasn't just a one-time happening where God did something and disappeared. This is the manner of God's walking with His people, of God's guiding them, leading them, protecting them. His presence begins and it doesn't end. That's the thought here. I found as I looked through uh, the study in chapter 14 that is the Egyptians pursued after them that they might not let them go uh, that when they when they came to the waters it says here that the the uh, verse 19 says the angel of God went before the camp out of Israel camp of Israel we moved and went behind them and and it was a, the pillar of cloud went before went from before their face, and it went around and stood behind them. And it came between the camp of the Egyptians and the camp of Israel. So here we have now the presence of God going before them, leading them. Now it's going to, now it's going to protect them. It, it lifts and it goes between them or behind them and the pursuing enemy. And I love this here. And it was a cloud of darkness to them, verse 20, chapter 14, but it gave light by night to these Israelites, so that the one came not near the other all the night. The presence of God was established for the people, uh, and, and God was in that. So here the angel of God in that cloud comes between them. And uh, what, what uh, tremendous language here. Uh, we have. Notice that God is in this cloud. God himself is in this cloud. This is his presence. He, he looks from that cloud out and sees things to, pertaining to men. 
It came to pass that in the morning watch, the Lord looked out unto the host of the Egyptians through the pillar of fire of the cloud. The pillar of fire and the cloud and troubled the host of the Egyptians. God looked out from that cloud and saw the Egyptians and he dealt with them as such. This isn't just a, a cloud hanging around. This is God's very presence amidst among his people. And it's an active presence. And from that place of dwelling, the Lord dealt with the enemy. It says in verse 30, The Lord saved Israel that day out of, out of the hand of the Egyptians. How do you do that? When he saw the Egyptians. When Israel saw the Egyptians dead upon the seashore, God saw the Egyptians and God wiped them out. And Israel saw that. They saw the hand of God at work twice in this passage. Uh, we find the phrase, the Lord will fight for us or fight for them. And that's what the Lord did. The, chapter 15, we get to the song of Moses, the song of Israel, the song of redemption it's called which is a celebration of the fact that God came down and rescued his people. All they did was stand back and see the salvation of the Lord. But God came down in their midst, and he was active in their midst. I think that's important. God isn't a silent partner in this thing of meeting with his people. God is very active, and so ought his people to be active. It is fellowship, one with another. And uh, indeed, God did that. I need to wrap this up, but let me look at a couple more verses. In this celebration song, once they were safely on the other side of the shore, uh, we find uh, a couple of thoughts here. Again, redemption is essential to fellowship. Verse 13 says that in your mercy, praying, uh, praising unto God, he led forth the people which he had redeemed. Thou hast guided them in thy strength unto thy holy habitation. They saw the place where they were as being the place of meeting with God, God's habitation. Again, verse 16 to 17, at the end of verse 16, who is it that says this? O Lord, the, till the people passed over, which thou hast purchased, redemption. Thou shalt bring them in and plant them in the mountain of thine inheritance in the in thy place, in the place, O Lord. Excuse me, let me read that again. I missed a phrase. Thou shalt bring them in and plant them in the mountain of thine inheritance in the place, O Lord, which thou hast made for thee to dwell in. Now, it wasn't that God needed a dwelling place, but it's that God chose to dwell amongst his people. Notice the end of the verse here, verse 17 which thou hast made for thee to dwell in, in the sanctuary. Wait a minute. Sanctuary? There was no dwelling place yet. There was no tabernacle made. There was no temple at this time. But the sanctuary of God is the place where God chose to meet and did meet with his people. And they met with him. They recognized that. O Lord, which thou hast made for thee to dwell in, in the sanctuary... O Lord, which thy hands have established. Again, God taking the initiative on establishing a place where they could meet with him. And it was in that place that the redeemed gave praise unto God's name in this chapter. There's more to it. But we need to leave it here for today and we'll come back and pick it up here and continue on looking at this matter of the meeting place, the meeting place of God with men. And may we be remembering that and, and even remember that God dwells in us now and that God in a very real sense meets with every one of us wherever we are. But he's also deemed and designed it that we would join together and worship him together as a saved people. Thanks for joining me tonight. We'll join up again next week as God dwells uh, as he leads. Father, thank you for our time together. Give us a sense, a sense of, of who you are, Lord. Uh, you're awesome. We know that. May we worship you reverently in our hearts, no matter where we are this day or as we gather together on this Lord's Day. In your name we pray it. Amen. God bless. See you next time.